Hello friends. Today I want to talk to you about overcoming disappointment and finding lasting happiness in relationships. It's a very important topic, especially for us as believers, because God designed us and built us to live in community. You know, we were designed to live in relationship with God and with one another, right? His purpose is that we serve our brothers and sisters and in turn, they serve us, right? Sometimes we meet their needs and other times they meet ours. And we have examples of this to follow, great examples in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament. But although this is God's ideal lifestyle for us, sometimes it breaks down. We don't always get it right. And uh, our families, our friendships, our churches, we forget that they're all made of people who are fallible, who have limited capacity sometimes, and limited ability sometimes. You know, we're all growing and learning. Sometimes we're thriving and other times we're going through suffering. And so when these relationships break down and we find that our needs are not being met in the way that God intended, there's a temptation for us to become disappointed in people, right? And this can open the door for us to withdraw and isolate ourselves, to sort of shut down our heart and never trust again. And it even opens the door for bitterness. So we have to be really, really careful about that. In this video, I wanna talk about the, the power to overcome that disappointment, the power to release people, especially in those times when we feel our needs are not being met. It's kind of counterintuitive because what happens is we can find greater joy and fulfillment and happiness in those same relationships that previously let us down. And we can actually find a hidden opportunity to go deeper in God and to strengthen our relationship with him. So I'm Jeff. This is the Majesty Mystery Tour. Please like, subscribe, and share. Okay, so my text for this, the Lord taught me this in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 10. I'm just going to read Philippians 4, 10 to 13. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked the opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is a really, really deep passage. The Lord used this in my life to teach me some deep and powerful lessons, and it changed my life. This went from, you know, being the verse that, uh, that you tell yourself before you're stepping up to the plate to like, you know, you're at bat playing baseball or something. I mean, before like the sports moment, we see in a lot of movies, right, where the championship is on the line and they're like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This goes way deeper into that. And it's not just about winning, you know, this is really about living life to its fullest and really developing that Christ-like character and walking out your calling and destiny to become like Christ in every situation. So let's get into this. The backstory to this is really, really interesting and it gives us some insight into these four verses, okay? Uh, Paul had planted this church in Philippi during his second missionary journey. He had great success there. This is where he had his first convert in Europe, a businesswoman named Lydia. This is where Paul had ministered deliverance to the, the slave girl who had a spirit of divination, a python spirit. I mean, she was following him around for days and saying, these are the men of God. And he turned around and said, enough. Well, that ended up landing him in prison. This is the prison where they were worshiping at midnight and there was an earthquake and it broke all the doors open. And so this is when the jailer was gonna kill himself because he thought all the prisoners had escaped. And Paul said, don't harm yourself, we're still here. And so the jailer took him home. Paul shared the gospel and the jailer and his whole family came to the faith and came to know the Lord. So his ministry in Philippi began with this great dramatic success. And the Philippians developed a great affection for Paul and Paul for them. It wasn't just sort of like, you know, pastor or evangelist in church. They really developed a bond of friendship. They really looked out for one another. Out of this friendship, they became ministry partners. When Paul left the city, the Philippian church supported him financially. They sent him money when he was in need financially. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 4 to 8, 
Paul writes this to the Philippians. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I have you in my heart. I long for all of you, the affection of Christ Jesus. So they had developed this partnership, but even more than the partnership, they had developed a bond of friendship. And these were people that did above and beyond the other churches and the other places that Paul had ministered in. In Philippians 4, 15 and 16, Paul writes this to them. When I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except only you. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Now, this is what's really interesting because there has been established here a great friendship and a great ministry partnership. And Paul had come to rely on them when he was in need. This is why the backstory is so important. But for some reason, in Philippians chapter 4, those verses of 10 to 13, for some reason, Paul is referencing here that there came a time when they couldn't help him. We don't know what the reason was, but there just came a point where they said, you know, Paul, we can't help you this time. And Paul had to like go through this time of suffering, a time when he needed help, and his friends didn't come through. They couldn't come through. They had nothing to offer. And Paul was left to himself and had to figure something else out. So how did Paul respond to this breakdown in support? Let's take a look at this again from the text in Philippians 4, verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, you lack the opportunity. So here's what's great. The first lesson that we can take away from this, when uh, relationships disappoint us and when our brothers and sisters and friends just don't come through for us, he never stopped believing that they loved him. He never doubted their love. He just realized they don't have the capacity right now. They don't have the ability right now. See, typically what we do is we start blaming people. We start accusing them of being bad friends or, you know, I was there for you. We get this sort of entitlement, you know, you owe me. You know, I thought I could trust you. I thought I could count on you and you said you would. And, you know, it, we can get into manipulation. We can start to have a demanding soul that puts demands on people. And if we follow Paul's example, he never left room for that disappointment by remembering that they were human. He just remembered, look, I know you guys love me. And it must be that for whatever reason, you just don't have the ability to help right now. You just don't have the capacity right now. And that's okay. And I think that's the best place for us to start. This is where the Lord brought me when I was going through struggles with people years ago. He, he brought me right to these four verses. And he was like, man, they're human. They don't always have full capacity to help you every time you're in need. And the Lord told me this. He said, guess what? You've let people down before too. So it's very important that we remember that people have limited capacity and don't automatically doubt their love or affection for us or their friendship. Just realize they're human too and they're running into limitations in their ability to, to show empathy or to, to give companionship or advice or time. It's okay. They're just at their max and they don't have the capacity, okay? So let's look at verse 11. Paul goes on and says, not that I speak in regard to my need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now, this is where it really gets good because this Greek word used here uh, for content is not like the English word content. The English word content that we use, the definition of it is satisfied. Paul, if we read it with the English definition, he would say, I've learned in whatever state I am to be satisfied. And a lot of times I know for me in my life, Growing up in the church, when I would hear this, I would be like, yeah, I, I should stop wanting so much and just be satisfied. Or I should stop wanting a friend. I should just embrace this loneliness and learn to be satisfied. You know, it kind of puts a more of like, you just need to suck it up, buttercup kind of attitude. But in the Greek, the word is autarkies. Autarkies. The word translated content in English is autarkies in the Greek. And it means this needing no external source of strength. Strong enough within oneself to need no aid or support. Independent of external circumstances. Now, this doesn't mean that 
you become an island and you wall your heart off and I don't need anybody, I'm a lone ranger. Now, if we read it the way it really is in the Greek, Paul is saying, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to not need any external source of strength, to be strong enough within myself to need no outside aid or support, to be independent of the circumstances around me. And why do you think that is? It's because his source was the Holy Spirit of God within him. It wasn't sheer force of will and determination. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about going deeper, seeing this as an opportunity. The fact that my friends can't come through for me right now, so this must be an opportunity for me to go deep in God and realize that he is my source and no one else. That my friends are not my refuge, the Lord is my refuge, amen? This is an opportunity for us. This is one of the things where we can actually turn this thing around. The evil one wants to accuse our brothers and sisters. He wants to blame them. He wants to lie to us and tell us that we're always going to be alone, that no one really loves you, that they don't believe in you. Wah, wah, wah. He's going to give all this stuff to us, right? What we need to do is turn this whole thing around and say, no, they do love me. They're just human. And you know what? In this trial, in my need, is a great opportunity for me to go even deeper in God and to check my, myself, check my own heart, my mind, and realize that, man, I'm not going to trust in anyone else to be my source or my refuge or my provider because the Lord is all those things for me. Isn't this great? The Lord taught me this. I had to learn this and walk this out. So I'm, I'm saying this with confidence. What he did for me, what he did for Paul, he'll do for you as well, okay? Paul learned the secret of tapping into the power of God by going through the process of people not being able to help him. So many times we don't want to go through the process. We don't realize that when these things come up, there's a hidden key, there's a hidden doorway, a hidden opportunity. It's in the process of going through the letdown that we find this deeper relationship with God, amen? It's not just theoretical. It goes from, I know God's my source, to I know God is my source, amen? Okay. So as the result of doing this, as a result of looking to God to be his source, you know, not accusing or blaming or getting offended at his friends in, in Philippi and really, you know, digging deep to find God to be his source in his time of need, this is what he says in verse 12 and 13. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in everything, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, to have a lot and also to suffer need. I can do all of these things through Christ who strengthens me. He's saying, I went through this process. Uh, on the, now he's on the other side of this opportunity, other side of this process. And he's saying, I figured out. I, my heart isn't taken captive by anything. I, wealth holds nothing for me. And I don't get depressed if I'm going through times of, of poverty and, and not having much. And material things, they don't have a hold on me. And, and I, I don't get discouraged and fearful if I don't have very much in the way of material things. He's saying it in all of these things, I can do anything through Christ because I've found my strength in him. He's found that autarkies in this opportunity of his friends not being able to help him out. And here's what's great. We know that Paul wasn't bitter towards them. Uh, he didn't have a lasting attitude. It didn't affect the relationship. The relationship just grew stronger. And here's why. Back in verse 10, this is what Paul says. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. So if you, you break this down, you know, they have this great relationship, this great partnership, but also a friendship, also a deep affection and, and concern for one another. And they had a habit of taking care of him. They had sort of adopted Paul. Even when he went to these other churches, he says, you're the only church that constantly took care of my financial needs. And it got to a point where, for whatever reason, they lack the ability to do that. And instead of blaming them, he says, you know what? I never doubted your love for me. I know that you love me, but there is an opportunity in this to find this source of strength in God, spirit to spirit, by meeting God within, where I now don't need any external source of support. I've learned to be strong and thrive no matter what is going on around me. 
And then he says, but you know what? When you were able to help again, I willingly accepted your help and I gratefully accepted your help. The relationship went on. I think God allows these times of suffering in our lives. God allows us to go through these times to remind us to check our heart. Is our refuge and our source in, in the people that we've come to rely on, or is it fully in him? And what is our heart made of? Are we demanding and entitled with the people around us, or can we give them grace and say, you know what, I'm human too. I know what it's like to be at my capacity and not have much left in the tank and bless them and leave the door of our heart open to them so that when they are able, we say, oh, it's great to be back. It's great to work with you again. It's great to have fellowship with you again, because that's the lesson here. So what do we do when people let us down? You know, the people that we count as family or our closest friends, the folks that we've come to rely on. And remember, this is godly. God built us to live in relationship. He built us to live in community. But it's an ideal that we aspire to, and it's not always perfect. We don't always get it right. So what do we do? Do we get offended and do we blame and accuse them? Do we withdraw and do we isolate and get into bitterness and rejection? Do we close down our heart and say, I don't need anybody? Or do we just say, I get it. You know, I've let people down too, and we're all human. So there's a couple of points that I want to leave you in, in closing here. First, when we go through times like this, have we even articulated our needs to people? So many times we just assume that people should know what we need without us having to say anything. It's just not true. People have so much going on up here. They have so much going on right here, especially in the world today. And we get offended so easily when someone doesn't anticipate or just sort of know our needs. Man, we really have to speak up and say, man, I, I need some time. I need to hang out or I need you to pray for me. Or can you give me some advice? Or can we spend some time together? Or whatever it is, before you get offended, have you even articulated your needs to them, right? And second, I would say to get over the disappointment, to begin turning that new leaf over, release people from godlike expectations. They're not unlimited. They're not infallible. They're not omnipresent. They're not omniscient, right? Just release them from having to fill this role that only God can fill. You know, allow them to be human, right? Don't expect them to be in the place of God and meet all your emotional needs. And then I would say third, see this as an opportunity. Really take God at his word. See this as an opportunity to sink your roots even deeper in the Lord. I remember years ago, I was praying. And I was like, Lord, please send me mentors. I need some mentors. I need some older fathers and mothers in the faith. You know, I'm we're a non-denominational church. We do have good relationships with other pastors and other churches, but they're more peer relationships. And one day in prayer, the Lord said to me, you know, I'd like to mentor you. <laughs> and the thought was like, duh, you know, he was like, I would like to mentor you. I would like you to bring me all uh, the questions in your heart, you know, all the concerns in your heart. Bring them to me and sit with me and learn, to, you know, from me and and let me bring you through the word and let me speak to you through my word. And man, the result of that was such a rich time in the Lord. I do believe in godly mentors. The fact of the matter is they're human too. I mean, they have capacity, they have limitations. It's very important that we're not looking to other people to do what only God can, right? So go deep and build history with God. And I would say the fourth thing and the last thing that we can do is to keep your heart open. Keep your heart open for future relationships with our brothers and sisters. Keep your heart open because when they're over their season of suffering, when they're back to having capacity, man, you can enjoy an even deeper satisfaction. You can share war stories and you can talk with them about what you went through and how God used it and what they went through and how God spoke to them. So don't cut them off. Don't shut your heart down. Leave your heart open. So I hope this encourages you today. I hope it gives you greater grace for the people in your life and that it sets you free from disappointment. I hope it inspires you to walk closely with the Lord, you know, to really dig deep in him, to find him as your source, to really explore and discover that autarkies for yourself. I'm reminded of David when he was at Ziklag. You know, he, he's not living in Israel. He's on the run from Saul. He's got this army made up of all these guys that were like in debt and depressed and outcast, you know. He's living in, in the city given to him by the Philistines, which was his enemy. You know, he was supposed to go and fight 
a battle against Israel and the Philistines sent him home. And when he got back, these raiders came and they had taken away all their stuff, including their wives and his children. So he's got no home. His enemy doesn't want him around. His, wife, his wives and children have been kidnapped along with everybody else. And now his army is going to rise up and kill them because they're sick of all this nonsense. You know, when are you going to finally be the man of God that everyone thinks you're supposed to be? And the scripture, he had nowhere to go. Nobody was for him. And the scripture says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Man, sometimes that's all we've got. We've just got to encourage ourselves in the Lord. So I hope this encourages you today. I hope it helps you to find that autarkies and go deeper in God. I'm Jeff. This is the Majesty of Mystery Tour. Please like, subscribe, and share.